in the in this series, uh, we're looking at unexpected encounters with Jesus and how they can uh, affect our lives. And last week we looked at uh, the first part of John chapter twenty and and this first unexpected encounter with Jesus by Mary Magdalene. Um, uh, the first unexpected encounter of the resurrected Jesus. I don't think I said that, but and uh, we shared with you how um, this opportunity, uh, like this opportunity with Mary Magdalene, gave an opportunity for a new type of relationship with Jesus, and and uh, a relationship that lasts forever. And so today we're going to continue on in this series, and um, last week we read down to verse 18 in John chapter 20, so if you have your Bibles, what we're going to do is we're going to pick right up in verse 19, and we're going to read uh, the next few verses there, and we're going to see another unexpected encounter with Jesus. And so uh, let's go ahead and read from God's Word this morning. John 20, verses 19 through 23 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst, and he said to them, Peace be unto you, or peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of God. Let's go to him in prayer together. Father, we do come before you this morning. And God, we're so thankful for your word. God, we're thankful today that we can and we do celebrate a resurrected Christ. A living Christ. And God, today, as we look at this word and this encounter of uh, the disciples with with you as you on that first day that you uh, resurrected from the grave. God, give us insight into who you are. God, help us to understand what that means for us. And God, help us to grasp, grasp that and, allow, and believe that and to allow you to change us and make us into, uh, into your instruments, Lord, into your children for your glory forever. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, last week, as we read, we left the text with Mary Magdalene having seen the resurrected Lord, having her encounter with him, and Jesus had told her to go tell the disciples uh, what she had encountered and what he had said about this new relationship with God, this unexpected eternal relationship where uh, God, Jesus God is their God and where the fa Jesus Father is their Father and he calls them his brothers. And so this relationship dynamic that they had shifts a little bit. And so today in our text as we read we see that we find ourselves that same day. That resurrection day. Uh, but it's later that evening. The disciples are gathered in, in one place and the language of the text suggests that uh, the door wasn't just shut, the door was locked. They were terrified of the Jews. They were afraid uh, that um, uh, they would also be arrested and maybe crucified. I mean, who could blame them? With everything that had been going on, uh, they, they probably were scared. And uh, but apparently, you know, this happens in our text after uh, Mary has gone to the tomb. She runs, she tells John and Peter the tomb's uh, open. They run, they look, they encounter the empty tomb themselves, and they go back, and they probably lock the door. They don't know what's going on. They're confused. And then Mary encounters Christ, and she comes and tells them this message. And here they are in this room, probably the upper room, the same place where they gathered for Passover, most likely. We don't know for certain where they were at. There's ten of them. Thomas is not there, we find out later in the text. And Judas obviously is not there. So the ten were gathered there in this upper room. 
hiding for their lives and probably trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Um, but they, they have, seen, have this evidence that, that they've seen, that Mary Magdalene has come. She's given them this message. Peter and John have seen the empty tomb and the grave clothes. And, 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 and then suddenly, out of nowhere, they have this unexpected encounter with Jesus. The text says that Jesus suddenly appeared to them in their midst. He gives them a common greeting. He says, peace be with you. He probably said shalom, a Hebrew word that means peace or peace to you. And just a common greeting that he probably would have given the disciples uh, or anybody else he encountered before his crucifixion and and so there wasn't anything unusual about that and and at first glance the disciples might have thought they were seeing a spirit a ghost of Jesus uh, and uh, th there was probably some confusion so then Jesus shows them his hands and his side and I kind of imagine they're probably sitting around the room and and all of a sudden when they realize Jesus is there after he speaks he he probably just kind of does one of these numbers you know and just just kind of kind of shows them and, and and he's doing that probably so that they could have the assurance that this was that same Jesus that they followed for the last three and a half years that was crucified and placed in the tomb as a matter of fact Luke records that as the reason that Jesus does this very same thing with some other uh, folks that he encounters along the way. He, he says in Luke 24, 39 and 40, he says, Behold my hands and my feet. It is me, basically he says, he says, touch me and see. Because he says the spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you can see that I have. And then he showed them and his hands and his feet. And so when we read our text today, it says that when Jesus did this, the disciples were glad. They had these emotions. There was probably some joy, some elation. They were probably like, oh, it really is Jesus. There was, there was this spirit of, of excitement and, and, and probably a peace and a calm. Jesus said peace. They probably experienced a lot of peace at that point. And, and uh, you know, they were assured that he, he wasn't a ghost. It was. That same Jesus, this was the encounter that they're having. And, and, you know, maybe this was that first indication to them that what Jesus had said previously about dying and being raised again, it, this is probably the first indication that that began to resound in their hearts and minds as being the truth. And they begin to put it all together. And, and maybe they remembered the words of Jesus when he was there at the tomb of Lazarus. In John chapter 11, we see Jesus, he says this, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's some important words. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says, he who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. And he says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. <laughs> Maybe they were remembering that in this moment when they encountered Jesus. And Jesus said, do you believe this? He asked all those watching him there at the tomb of Lazarus. And, and maybe they were finally able to answer, yes, I believe. I believe it, Jesus. You said it. Now I see you and I believe it. Oh, man. And it, it's a critical question for us to answer. It's a critical question for you to answer. Do you believe this do you believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life do you believe that if you believe that is the truth that you will receive him and you will receive the gift of eternal life in him can you say yes to that can you say yes I believe that you see because when you say yes to that, and you believe that Jesus Christ is God in flesh and that he's crucified and resurrected, the blessings that God will pour out in your life for all eternity are indescribable. And this past week, I got a, I got a call from Christy. The title of the message today, by the way, is Unexpected Gifts. And I probably should have said that earlier, but, but that's the reason I'm talking about gifts here. 
Uh, this past week, I got a call from Christy one day. I was out doing some of my visits, and she got me on the phone, and she says, hey, she says, uh, I, I got online, and I was looking at our checking account, and guess what? And I said, what? And she said, our stimulus money is there. And, you know, I was, I was glad. <laughs> you know, I said, hey, you know, I mean, it's always awesome when you get an unexpected gift. It's always great when you uh, receive a gift, but it's even greater when you get something that really you, you weren't expecting. Now, we were expecting the stimulus check, but a few weeks back, we weren't expecting this gift, right? And so, uh, you know, before all this chaos broke with this virus, uh, we never thought anything about getting this kind of gift from our government, but I'm thankful for it. And, and today, what I want to do is I want to share with you three unexpected gifts that you receive when you encounter the resurrected Jesus and believe in him. That's what I want to share with you today. Three gifts. The first one is this. You receive the gift of peace. When you have an encounter with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and you believe, you say, yes, I believe you're the resurrection and the life, you receive the gift of peace. And, you know, we see this in our text today as Jesus comes, he appears in the midst of them out of nowhere. He didn't have to open the door. He didn't have to knock. He didn't say, hey, where's the key? He didn't know where the key was hidden. He didn't have to hide out and wait till everybody to get there and jump out in the middle of the room. None of those theories needed to be. Now, our God can do what he wants to. But, you know, I'm not going to get into the hows and whys. But obviously, Jesus, all of a sudden, he appears in the midst of the disciples and he says, the first thing he says is peace. Peace, brothers, right? We say that a lot, don't we? Peace, bro. I mean, that, that's what Jesus said, basically. Peace to you. And it, but it, there's meaning here. And normally, you know, this was a, a normal, everyday greeting. And it still is in, in, in uh, Israel. You hear shalom a, a lot. And, uh, but... Normally, maybe since it is that normal greeting, we wouldn't have paid that much attention to it in our text. But because he uses it twice here, I think it's something that we really should pay attention to. And because uh, of the way it's included in the text, I think it's really important that, that we understand the importance of the peace that comes when you place faith in the resurrected Christ. He gives you peace, a gift of peace. You know, you cannot initiate peace with God. You can't do anything to make peace with God. You, because Jesus brings peace with him. It comes with him wherever he goes. He initiates the peace. He's the one who made all this possible. And he brings peace with him wherever he goes. That's why he's called the Prince of Peace. And so when you have Jesus in your life, you got peace in your life. And when the disciples saw the resurrected Jesus there in their midst and, and they believed, I, I can't help but think when he said, peace be with you, all of a sudden, all that fear, all that worry, all the unknown was gone. They felt peace because Jesus was there. He was in the midst of them. And, and suddenly, you know, in the midst of all this terrifying conflict, they experienced peace. And when Jesus died on the cross, I want you to understand, when he was crucified and he atoned for our sins, that's when he brought this peace that's possible through a relationship with him. Paul writes about it to the Ephesian church. We read about that in chapter 2, verses 14 at uh, 15 and 16, he says, For he himself, talking about Christ, is our peace. And he's made both one. He's broken down the middle wall of separation. He's abolished the, uh, the, the, his flesh, the enmity, the commandments, the law. And in verse 16, that he might, excuse me, the last part of verse 15, to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace. Putting death to enmity, verse 16 says. And the prophet Isaiah, he, he continues with this same type of thinking. Establishing this sacrificial work of Christ as something that brings peace. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says this. And y'all are familiar with this one. He says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement 
For our peace was upon him. You see, Jesus suffered and died and took your sins and mine on the cross to bring peace. When he was crucified, Jesus made a way for us to have peace with God. He destroyed the enmity with God that's caused by sin. Our, the sin in our life separates us from God. It makes us enemies of God. But when Jesus uh, took our sins on the cross, he removed our sins as far as the, the east is from the west. And he made a way for everyone to have access to God because of the peace that he brought. And all the hostility that existed between you and God was absorbed by the cross of Jesus. And this is why uh, Jesus wanted them to see his hands and his feet and his side. He wanted them to see the evidence of his great love and to believe that uh, in his great power over life and death. He wanted them to see that. And he wanted them to understand that, uh, that you know, when, when somebody loves you, uh, there's a peace that comes from knowing that you have that relationship with them. And Jesus is making that known. Jesus made a way for you to have peace with God through his atoning work on Calvary's cross. But not only does it make a way for you to have peace with God, the work of Jesus really makes a way for us to have peace with with others think about it there there you know when when you give your heart and life to Jesus and the the spirit of God comes into you and the spirit of Christ is in you there's no racism there's no classism there's no sexism Galatians 3:28 says there's neither Jew nor Cre uh, Greek nor slave nor free nor male or female, for we're all one in Christ Jesus and and that's what God gives us with one another. When we have an encounter with a resurrected Christ and we believe, we have peace with God and peace with others. But not only that, I think that he gives us peace uh, with ourselves. Because a lot of times uh, we get to the point where we can't even have peace all alone. Uh, our minds get so caught up and, 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 and um confused and, and in conflict with ourselves and a lot of times you know we, we don't have that clear conscience that we need Hebrews nine fourteen says how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God and so it's the blood of Christ it's this sacrifice of Christ and his atoning work that clear, can clear your conscience and give you peace with God. His resurrection also brings peace to the world. Remember that. You know, he brings us peace to the world. Isaiah 9, 7 says this, and we, re we hear this a lot at, at Christmas time, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end and upon the throne of David and over his kingdom it'll be established forever and ever and so uh, he brings peace forever because he's a ruling reigning king uh, in, in our world and so you see in this world you're going to experience all kinds of conflict conflict it robs you of peace um, you may be involved in conflict with your spouse or it might be a, a, a sibling or it might be you might have uh, uh, a problem with a child or a child with a parent or or maybe your conflict is with an employer or a co-worker that you just can't seem to get along with and and maybe it's a neighbor but but there's all kinds of conflict that takes place maybe your conflict is some of that inner inner conflict I was talking about maybe it's because of sin in your life or or confusion about purpose or who you are or what it is that you should be doing but I want you to understand that faith in the resurrected Jesus can bring you peace in any conflict I heard this story about two men who lived in a small village and they got into this terrible dispute and they just couldn't resolve it and so they decided to go talk to the town sage and so the first man went to the sage's home and he told his version of what happened. He told him the whole story and when he got finished, the sage says, you're absolutely right. And then the next night, the other man came and, and he went to the town sage and he told him his side of the story. And when he was finished, the sage looked him right in the eye and he said, you're absolutely right. 
Well, the sage's wife uh, just scolded her husband terribly. And she said, those two men came to you. They told you two completely different stories. And you told them both that they were absolutely right. She said, that's impossible. They both cannot be absolutely right. The sage looked at his wife and he said, yep, you're absolutely right. (laughs) Oh, man, The, the town sage... He had his way of bringing peace, evidently. And you know, maybe it was just being agreeable. And I'm not sure how that worked for him. But I want you to know that Jesus, through his love and his atoning work, he has provided the perfect plan for endless peace. I want you to understand that today when you have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, if you believe in him, you can receive peace forever. Or you can walk away from him in unbelief. And in that decision, I want you to know and I want to warn you, you will never, ever find peace. And so... One gift that you receive when you encounter the resurrected Jesus and believe is you receive the gift of peace. Another gift that you receive when you encounter Jesus and you believe is this. You receive the gift of power. And I want you to look at verse 22 with me here. And, and um, you know, when we think about power, we talked about the opposite of peace being conflict. Well, the opposite of power is weakness. Do you ever feel weak, spiritually weak? Do you ever feel spiritually defenseless? You know, you're, you're, you're being tempted and you're tried and, and you know God wants you to do something. You don't have courage and, and, you know, this sin's plaguing you and you just don't seem like you can overtake it and all those things. Well, you know, that's weakness. And, and, but, but in Christ, Christ gives you power to overcome all those things. And, and I, I want you to understand that if you have faith in the resurrected Christ and you believe in him, then you receive the power of God. And I want to admit to you, there's some stuff in this text today in verses 22 and, fo- and 23 that are very difficult to parse out and understand. And verse 22 is one of them. And I've never heard anybody preach on this, so... Uh, uh, you know, I'll just have to take my word on it, I guess. But, uh, but, <laughs> but, but when you look at this, it is, it, there's some questions. It, it's difficult to explain because Jesus, it says, when he told them, peace be with you, he, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And now if you're really familiar with the Bible, you think, well, wait a minute. The disciples didn't receive the Spirit of God until Pentecost. So what in the world's happening right here on the first Resurrection Sunday in that room where there's ten disciples minus Judas, right? I mean, Thomas and Judas. The ten are there and, you know, there's questions. <laughs> and maybe we can't even answer them, but, but I'm sure the disciples, when Jesus did this and, and it was happening to them, I'm sure they probably remembered some of the things that Jesus had said. Back in John chapter 14 and verse 26, he told them, That uh, he said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, who my Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he'll help you remember the things that I said to you. And in John 16 and verse 7, Jesus told him this. He says, I tell you the truth. He said, "It's, it's to your advantage that I go away. And he said, because if I don't go away, the helper, this Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. And then we think about Acts 1 And verse 8, you know, the precursor to Acts 2 and the Pentecost, so when the Holy Spirit came upon all of them, he says uh, to his disciples there uh, on the mount just before he ascends, he says, but you will receive power. See that? Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so... I mean, the day of Pentecost, and when we think about God pouring out His Holy Spirit into His people, isn't going to take place for another 50 days in this story. The disciples don't even know about that yet. And so, to be honest, you know, I'm not sure exactly what happened here. 
it's got me confused a bit. But, but, and so I think, well, what happened after this? Were they filled with the Spirit like everybody else was on the day of Pentecost? Well, uh, there's some evidence that suggests maybe they weren't. Because you think about what happened after this, you know, they, 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 they went back to whatever it was they were doing, it seems. They went back to fishing and, you know, and what, tax collecting, I guess, maybe. I don't know, whatever. But we know that, that uh, Peter and John went back to fishing and, and uh, there doesn't appear to be any immediate spiritual enlightenment or a spiritual activity that suggests that they had been really empowered at that moment with the Holy Spirit. But maybe they were. I, I, I don't know because we don't know a whole lot about everything that happened uh, the next little bit. But but what did happen here, maybe, maybe it was an unexpected encounter with Jesus, an unexpected event in this encounter that would prove to be an important reminder that the power of God, the Holy Spirit of God, would be present in their lives and that Jesus personally imparted that to them. I, I know this is, this is something special to them that wasn't part of, it appears of the rest of those followers, that those 120 that were in that upper room and everyone else hints, but maybe it pointed them to Pentecost and something that they would look forward to. And, and, but, I, but I want to remind you exactly what the breath of God means because it says he breathed into them. You know, the word for breath and spirit in, in the Greek language, it's the same word. And it's, it's, that's true in Hebrew as well. But, but we distinguish the two in English. And it's easy for us to know which one we're talking about because of the translation. But, but they wouldn't have really been able to distinguish the two except for context. And, and so when I think about this, it takes my mind all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Oh, excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 7. <clears throat> when God created man. And the, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. <laughs> and Jesus, remember Jesus told Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. God gives life. He gave life to Adam here by breathing on him. The breath of God gives life. And when you encounter the resurrected Christ and you believe in him, you know what he does? He gives you eternal life. And at this moment, in that room, they encountered the resurrected Jesus. And I believe in that moment, he breathed into them life. And the power of God that comes with that life through the Spirit of God. And that, my friend, is in you forever. The power of God. Because of the indwelling breath of God. The Spirit of God who, who takes up residence in those who believe. One New Year's Day in the Tournament of Roses Parade, a, a beautiful float suddenly sputtered and, and quit and it was out of gas and, and the whole parade was held up because somebody's truck ran out of gas and uh, the amusing thing about it was but this float was represented by the standard oil company that's right with all of its vast oil resources their truck run out of gas <laughs> i can't imagine what publicity all right but I want you to understand this. When you believe on Christ and the power of his resurrection and he breathes this life into you and fills you with his own power, with that power, no virus, no disease, no conflict you face in this life stands a chance if you trust God and let his power be birthed through your living and you depend on him and do the right thing and carry out his will for your life. So an encounter with the resurrected Christ gives you peace. It gives you power. One more gift I want to share with you that you can receive when you believe. When you encounter the resurrected Christ and that's this. You receive the gift of purpose. And so we look at verse 21. Again the last part there. He says, 
Even as, or as the Father has sent me, I also send you. The opposite of purpose is aimlessness. Uh, you know, when, when, when God resurrected Christ from the dead, um, he, he didn't do that so that we could just live however we want to and continue with life how we want to after our encounter with a resurrected Christ. When you encounter the resurrected Christ, it's going to change you. It's going to change who you are. It's going to change what you're about. And I want you to understand, God has a purpose and a plan for you. And that's the reason Jesus told his disciples after he breathed this breath of life into them, he says, the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And, uh, and so, you know, the Father sent Jesus on a unique mission. He, in John three seventeen, we read this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so the mission of Jesus was to provide salvation to, to everyone who believes. And, and now Jesus sends his disciples and he sends you and I, or sends me and you to proclaim God's salvation through, through him. Verse 23 is a continuation of this, this commission that he's given them to, to go. And it, it's, it's really at first glance, more difficult to interpret than, than uh, verse 22 that we looked at. Look what he says. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And so it, it almost seems like Jesus is saying, hey, look, you've got the power to forgive sins. And you've got the power to say, nope, not forgiven. That's what it, it looks like. But we know... That a man can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. That's been established earlier. But, but what we see here, and what we, something else that we do know that helps us understand what he's talking about here, is that believers can proclaim a man's sins are forgiven if he believes and receives Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, John writes this, he says, But as many as received him, to them... He gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Believers can proclaim a person's sins are forgiven. They can also proclaim a person's sins are not forgiven when they do not believe in Christ. And so Jesus was basically saying, when you go and tell people what I've done, speaking my word about my work and the power of my spirit, it's God who's speaking through you. And if they do not believe, I don't forgive. But if they do believe, I will forgive their sins. And so it's a message of hope. It's a message, a determined message, a message of warning. And so we need to understand that. Part of our mission is to give people an opportunity to be forgiven of their sins through faith in a resurrected Christ. And when they believe, we can say, your sins are forgiven. And when they don't believe, we can say, your sins have not been forgiven because you do not believe. That's, that's the message. That's it. And so that's our purpose. That's, that's our purpose, is to give people an opportunity to believe and be forgiven of sins. And, and a lot of times it's hard to know what our purpose is. Um, a Scotsman demonstrated the game of golf to President U Useless Grant. Ulysses, I don't know how you say it. I, don't, I always say useless, so I don't know how to really pronounce it. And it's useless if you've not got purpose, so there, we got to tie in. But, but a, a Scotsman came to demonstrate the game of golf to President Useless Grant. <laughs> and so he carefully placed the ball on the tee, and, and he got his club out, and he, he took a mighty swing, and, and the club hit the turf. And, and what happened was the, the dirt scattered all over the president's beard and all over his clothes in the vicinity, and everybody looked down, and the ball's still on the tee. And well, the Scotsman again, he took a swing, and he swung as hard as he could again, and he missed again, and patiently, President Grant watched six different times the Scotsman swing at this golf ball and miss. <laughs> and then quietly, he said, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game, but I failed to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> oh, man. And so, 
I want you to understand, sometimes we feel like that. We we can't quite find our purpose. I, I, one, of, one of our patients this week, we... I visited, and her husband, he's an elderly man, and his granddaughter was telling me, you know, he, he said he don't understand why God hasn't just taken him on. He says hey, he can't, he's not any good anymore. He doesn't do anybody any good. He don't understand why God's still there. And she said, I told him, says, Grandpa, Grandpa says, God's still got a purpose for you here. And that's what I want you to understand. God has a purpose for you. When you are discouraged and defeated and life feels like it's beat. You feel like life is beating you like a drum and you feel like you have no purpose. I want you to remember your encounter with the resurrected Jesus and that your purpose is to proclaim the resurrected Christ and his story so that others are given the opportunity to experience their own personal encounter with the resurrected Christ and receive the forgiveness of sin and enter into an eternal relationship with Him. That, my friend, is the purpose that Christ gives you when you believe in Him. You see, when you have an encounter with Him, He gives you peace in the midst of great conflict. He gives you power in your weakness to overcome the world and all of its temptations and he moves you from aimlessness and gives you purpose and a reason for pressing on in your life and living for him and I want you to see that this morning but the question ultimately is this do you believe do you believe <laughs> the resurrected Christ is trying to convince you that he loves you, that he died for your sins, and that he's alive, and he wants to breathe into you the breath of life and give you his peace. <laughs> and he wants to, to give you purpose. And he wants to use his power in you to do that work. And so right now, if you feel the Spirit of God calling you and drawing you to him, I want to encourage you to open your heart and your arms and just embrace him. Will you do that today? The Bible says that if we confess our sins with our mouth and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, that he'll save us. I encourage you to do that. Call out to him right now and say, Dear Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. I'm in need of your forgiveness. And I want you to come into my heart and my life. Lord, I invite you to save me, to change me. Breathe in me your breath of life. If you'll pray a prayer like that, the Bible says he will save you. And so right now we're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond. And if you have a need, if you want to talk, you can text or call uh, anybody in the Fellowship Church. You can reach out to me. Last week, I had somebody reach out to me. And uh, we're going to respond to you as soon as we can. We're going to pray with you and we're going to help you. But sing along with us. But most of important, right now, respond to the call of God on, on your life.